Hi, and welcome to Thinking Constellationally. I'm your host, Stephanie Senna, and we're on USALA Media. Thinking Constellationally is where we connect the dots between systems of oppression and between ourselves and our neighbors. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest today, Rob Fleming. Rob is the Director uh, and Professor of Sustainable Design at Thomas Jefferson University. He's also an architect and an author. And today we're going to be talking about uh, climate crisis and what we can do to uh, to make difference because we need to do that um, yesterday. So we are. I'm very excited to have him. I I met Rob uh, a, a few months ago when we were both uh, presenting at, at the APA conference, the American Planning Association conference, and we were speaking about the need for sustainable design and architecture and I was really blown away by Rob uh, and his knowledge and his message and also his ability to impart it to others and he's a great leader so um, Rob thank you so much for for being with me in the studio today well thank you for that great introduction of I course. appreciate it mm -hmm. um, Rob I wonder if we can start by you telling us a little bit about um, about you and and how you became so passionate about about this issue well, that's a great question. And it really, I, I look at a few defining moments in my life. One of the first ones was when I was at Woodstock in 1969. My mom decided to drive there and take us to Woodstock. And it was just one of the most not great experiences of my life mm. from a kid's point of view. There was no food. It was how, how old were you? Six that years I imagine old. Two. I was six, okay, six years six old. Six yep, years old. Absolutely. So, um, but it really shaped me and the way I think about the world because I saw half a million people coming together in the name of love and empathy and not in the name of sports or something like that. So it really set the stage for me to think about what was my life gonna mean and what was I gonna do? Wow, six years old. That mm -hmm. seems like a pretty defining moment. Yep. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so then, so ha have you known since six that, that you wanted to do something um, kind of with a broader uh, view in terms of connecting to people, the earth, nature. Is that something that was always in you or since you were six? I think at six, I was already an architect. Okay. I can say that for sure. But it wasn't until my mom took me and my sister across country mm. for a drive and okay. I saw the Colorado Rockies. Ah. And I understood what nature really was and okay. I had an intrinsic connection to it. And I thought, wow, this has got to be, I didn't think this is my life mission. Nobody does that. But on the other hand, it really deeply impacted me. And I and from that day, I thought about nature a lot as really something that I was connected to. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and you have been able to marry, I guess then, two mm -hmm. areas of passion for you. One is design in the built world, mm -hmm. and the other is nature and sustainability. Right, and there's a third one. Okay, tell me. So the third one came when uh, my mom, again, decided to move us from Willingboro, New Jersey, the second Levittown all-white community into West Philadelphia in 1969. It's a huge where shift. We became one of the first white families on the block, and um, I learned a lot about the world, and I suppose that's where I got to see that, hmm, different people get treated differently just because of the color of their skin or their economic background. So, you know, I don't want to say social equity was a mission for me, but it was certainly something that has been with me since that time, growing Amazing. up in West Philly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, remind me, what did you? How old were you when you moved to West Philly? Uh, then? Seven, maybe okay. eight, or something like That's that. That's incredible. Yeah. Your mom, yeah. by the way, sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah, she she was. Wow. She really was. Mm -hmm. Um. So and 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 what year was that then? When when you moved to West Philly? Probably right after Woodstock. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you remember Move and the bombing? Yeah. At Osage so, Avenue. So uh, short story there. Yeah. My dad. Um, my parents had split up pretty young when I was pretty young, but my dad lived a block from the move in Palton Village in West Philadelphia. And the roof of his house was where some of the snipers were wow. looking down on the move complex. So I have a lot of familiarity with move and that experience too. Wow. We happen to have been on vacation during the actual shootout. Um, so I can't speak to that, but I can speak to a lot of my experiences with that group. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Yep. Oh my goodness. And one of the move nine was just um, I saw that. Yes. released from prison finally Absolutely. after so many years. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think in that incident uh, where Philadelphia became notorious for the, the city that bombed itself, 69 right. houses, I think, uh, were on uh, fire or something. That was that the second move incident yes, in 1980, yeah. and mm -hmm. yeah, the entire block went down. Wow, um, wow. So that was, so that was an ama a pretty uh, heightened uh, time for you to move to West Philly. I mean, you moved before that, but you were there for oh, it. Oh, yeah, I was there for the whole thing, for both events. I lived in right. West Philly at that time. Wow, wow. Yeah. So this, this was all very 
instrumental in shaping how you see the world and mm -hmm. your place in it. That's and so true. you've become kind of an activist and a fighter for a more just and equitable world for um, people of all races and, and also for nature. I'd like to think that I do in my own yeah. way, yeah. I see you like that. Okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you for telling us a little bit about what brought you to, to, to have these passions. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit more about, um, uh, about your world today. And, yeah, so 23 years later, or how many years later, now here we are at the brink of a major climate shift. Um, it's one thing to talk about climate change abstractly, but now we're sort of in it for real. And I think that there's some, some things that people are missing about temperature. The idea of one degree or two degrees Fahrenheit, who cares about that? It's just a couple degrees, right? Well, think about your kids. Your kid has a 98.6 temperature normally. And now all of a sudden, if you think about two degrees centigrade, is actually 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're heading towards your child having a 102.8 fever. And so the earth actually is sick right now, if you look at the metaphor. And what's happening is that the, all those projections that you see about 2100, that far away date, well, that's really 2050. All of those things that we thought were really far off are actually within our lifetime and certainly within my kid's lifetime. So, so now we're really past the point of the conceptual idea of sustainability or climate change and we're, we're going to be quickly into a reactive mode. Wow. Um, thank you for making that analogy. Mm -hmm. I never ha heard it like that and it really crystallizes mm -hmm. the significance. So um, I'm going to use that if you don't please, mind from now do. on. I didn't make it. It wasn't mine either. So okay. you're free to use that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, that, that's pretty intense. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it just hit me. Um, so, so, so we're, we're in the midst of a crisis and, um, do you feel that people are waking up to it, that they're responding effect, effect, effectively? What, how do you see, um, people's response to no, this? No, I actually don't. Okay. And, and I have, I think there are real good reasons why. I think that the problem with sustainability and climate change is we're not hardwired to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So we are hardwired to get food here and now. When we look at it, we're still those same hunter-gatherers that roam the planet looking for food, and we're still driven in, in large part by short-term thinking. So a lot of people say, "What? Well, but the sustainability and climate change really requires long-term thinking and requires a global perspective. And these are things that we are not trained to do, we're not hardwired for, and hence why we have so many, so many problems. And then the second part, of course, is all of that short-term thinking comes out in self-interest and greed and security and wanting too much and materialism and wanting to feel secure, safe, right? These things play out in really negative ways and now we're seeing the price that we're paying in the, in the larger global environment. Um, when I was a kid, I don't remember learning about this much <laughs> at all. I, um, I don't believe we even learned about recycling when I was a kid. Uh, I, I know that uh, I had friends who, who kind of monitored how much water they used and, and mm -hmm. I you know, thought that was quirky, um, but I distinctly don't remember <laughs> this, be, this being something that was taught. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am hoping that it's being covered in schools today. Do you think that it is? Well, yeah, first off, hope is a strategy. <laughs> and I think that is one of the things that we can't lose. And I do think it's being taught today in schools. And I know this is true because I'm looking at the enrollment in my sections of my sustainable design class, which I try to open up to the entire university. And this semester I have maybe 45 students in two sections. Okay. Only three of those are actually my students in my program. So I'm really excited uh -huh. to see this just flourishing of interest and desire of the younger generation to really take action. And okay. part of that is getting the foundation and fundamentals of what is sustainable design and why it's important. Okay, that's amazing. How long have you been teaching this class? Um, I started teaching sustainable design in 1997. Okay. So in 2022, I'll be celebrating my 25th anniversary of a sustainability activist. And I've Incredible. been teaching this particular class for about 13 years. Okay, and are you seeing a shift, not just in who is taking the class, but how the students are responding, reacting, their worldviews, do you think? I definitely see it. I think this okay. next generation coming up behind me or us, I don't know what your generation is, but I see that college level generation is having some real ethical values and some real understanding of what's at stake. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, you you just said you think that hope is a strategy. Yes. Uh, can you maybe expand on that a little bit? <laughs> well, it, it, that, that came from uh, my early years as an advisor working with freshmen and they would come into the office and said, I hope that I hope I pass that final. <laughs> and I would say, well, hope is not a strategy. But when it comes to climate change and the world, we cannot, if we lose hope, we're pretty much doomed meaning that we will hit a dystopian future that we're all worried about. So hope is one of the best 
strategies that we can use to try to look more towards a utopian society, as long as that hope is followed up by some sort of action. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, if you don't mind, I, I, it reminds me of, um, I just started my course. Uh, I teach um, at in Villanova University Center for Peace and Justice, and I teach a course on history of poverty and homelessness. And if you don't mind, I want to um, connect that to something that I was just teaching. Please do. Um, so I think that uh, it is very, I understand why people, if they tune into this stuff, if they learn about how our, we're in this major climate crisis, our earth is on fire, and and there's so many people who are affected. Certainly, I, uh, I we believe the biggest victims of climate change are those who are um, on the margins, people of color, people who are poor, um, the poorest amongst us are really the ones suffering the most from climate change now, although it it is, I think, a snake eating its own head. It will affect all of us, but the ones who are definitely suffering now and suffering the most are those with the fewest resources. Um, but it's easy to see and hear and learn about all of this and become so depressed and despondent and give up and throw your hands up and say, I'm done. Um, and so I start my class by explaining to my students that um, really the way that I look at it, if we're looking at the, the entirety of human history, um, we learn about ancient, uh, the, uh, ancient Mesopotamia as the first civilization. And, and students, K through 12 and onward, tend to learn very little about life before ancient Mesopotamia. And they learn sure. from ancient Mesopotamia today. Um, which, But if you learned about all of human history uh, from ancient Mesopotamia to today, that is only about 5% of human history. For 95% of human history, people operated and lived differently Correct. Um, with with their connection to nature and the environment and the world and each other. It was a much more equitable way of living and, and cooperation was prized over competition. And certainly biologists, scientists, historians, archaeologists, anthropologists have plenty of information and knowledge about how people lived prior to that. I believe that we only think of ancient Mesopotamia so long ago because we call it ancient. If we called it recent Mesopotamia, it, we would think differently about it. Words matter. But I believe everything from then until now, in my perspective, very little has changed from then until now. Um, and we are basically operating in a very similar system, um, but it's a failing system and it is not working for, for most of humanity and for our environment. Um, the thing that gives me hope when we talk about hope as a strategy is a system that has only operated for 5% of all of human con you know, history. Uh, to think that that will exist forevermore is really a pipe dream. It's, 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 so in this question of um, what is inevitable, I think it's inevitable that we need to change major structures because the ones we have are not working. And I also believe that 95% of human history gives me hope that we we as a human species once operated in a different way, number one. Number two, greed is not necessarily human. We tell ourselves, and if we say that, that greed is the, the thing that makes us human, then we can say this is all inevitable because humans will automatically make this terrible. And if we shift our thinking to say actually that's not so, and history tells us differently, that, that m mostly humanity is about cooperation and problem solving and working effectively together to, to solve these crises. I think that opens up our idea to the way we can potentially operate based on historically using history as a laboratory, knowing that it operated that way for the most of our time on, on Earth, on the planet. So anyway, that's a long little shtick, but really I start that way because I say to my students, you're coming into this class on history and homelessness, and I dedicate my entire life to solving this problem as you are dedicating your entire life to solving this problem. And in order to get up every single day and do this work day in and day out that is heartbreaking and devastating, we have to have hope that it's going to matter, right? Otherwise, why get out of bed? Exactly. So so I, I just, I'm sorry, when you said that hope is a strategy, I really wanted to like tell you that I connect to that. Um, and it's crucial that we hold on to that so that we don't, throw our hands up in the air, right? Right, exactly. And you demonstrated one of the core com components of sustainable design thinking is that you think over the long stretch of time. Mm -hmm. 
And we realized not only is most of our existence been as hunter-gatherers and cooperative, empathetic beings, but humans themselves are really a blip of a blip of a blip on the long timeline of planet Earth. If planet Earth is half through its life, 4.5 billion years done, 4.5 billion years to go, mm, wow. human civilization maybe 100,000 years, and age of agriculture 14,000 years. It's nothing. Wow, yep. So to your point, we don't have to believe that this is the way it's always going to be. In fact, it won't will either change or change will come to us. That's so exactly right. I prefer to be proactive and think mm -hmm. about sustainability and sustainable design and try to really be proactive on that and think about not having a dystopian future and having a different kind of future. So we spent a lot of time painting that picture. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think probably what what I have found that I need uh, to do this work, it's it's like um, an ingre you know the ingredients I need. One is hope, another is anger. I do have anger. Mm -hmm. I, th I would say that the three are hope, anger, and love. Okay. Right. So so anger about what we are currently doing, hope that we can do differently, and love for uh, each other, for ourselves, for, you know, for for the environment. We have to have right. a deep love there, right? Right. I, and oh, absolutely. Yeah, and and I try to like tap into those things mm -hmm. when in solving mm -hmm. this because it is, um, I think that those three emotions are very human and we mm -hmm. can all relate to them, and um, and it, it's it's good to tap into those things more when we're thinking about these big problems that we need solving. Oh yeah, I mean there's no no doubt about it, and the anger of course leads to short, the anger is the hard one because it could lead to short term mm -hmm. decisions. So managing that anger and channeling that anger into something that's gone to do something. So one of our grad students, she came to the university, she says, why isn't everybody doing sustainability? Why aren't we recycling everything? And she was really angry. I said, turn that into your thesis, do that. And so there's this young woman named Morgan Berman who started this company called Milk Crate, where she goes and works with large companies to help the entire company shift their consciousness towards sustainable behaviors. Wow. So, so this idea of anger is a really good, actually not a bad starting point. And if, if there are people listening and they're angry, they should immediately try to figure out a way to channel that into some definitive action. And these things will take root and have major change applications in the future. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love to hear how students are coming in. Thanks, Absolutely. You know, it, and how you're able to direct their anger. I think that's the thing is that people feel it. They need a mm -hmm. direction in terms of what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. so um, you're directing these students at Thomas Jefferson University, and it, it's it's important. We need it. Um, I, I have given conferences to architects, I, I presented it uh, to conferences at arch uh, of architects who are, um, they have to take these credits, I guess, every year. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of the credits is on sustainable design and on the need to design for people who ha are under-resourced. Yep. Um, which in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. we have about a quarter of the entire population of Philadelphia that's living below the poverty line. Of those people, about um, uh, over 50 percent, 80 percent of them, I'm sorry, are paying over 50 percent of their entire resources on housing. So I talked to architects about how to design uh, with that in mind and also with the environment in mind when I think both mm -hmm. of them go hand mm -hmm. in hand. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to convince architects. Um, so the fact that you are an architect thinking about sustainable design is really significant and I want to talk a little bit more about that when we come back from our break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with Rob Fleming. Being prepared is a part of who you are, but it's especially important in the case of a disaster. Be informed about possible emergencies in your area. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency. Build a kit with the things you need to survive. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Start your plan today. Go to ready.gov slash myplan. No one gets a diploma alone. You need support.
Thank you and welcome welcome back to Thinking Constellationally. I'm your host, Stephanie Senna on USA LA Media. And I have my guest today with me, Rob Fleming. Rob is the Director and Professor of Sustainable Design at Thomas Jefferson University. He's also an architect and an author. And I'm so excited to be talking to him about one of the most pressing issues today, uh, climate crisis and what we can do, um, what we need to do right now to make a difference. So Rob, if you could uh, please expand on for us um, teaching philosophy, how you understand engaging architects in this issue, and maybe um, new models for teaching on issues of sustainable design. Sure. It's a big, big story, but an important story because I, I did start um, teaching as an architect and just teaching architecture studio. And one of the funny things in 1997, it was really funny at that time, is at Thomas Jefferson University, we were just getting accredited. And at that time, the accreditors had a lot of sustainability in the requirements, which is really, really bold and imaginative. And we weren't doing so well at that time. And the dean looked around and said, well, who knows about this? I just finished my master's degree, and I did that for my thesis. Oh, wow. And so that was the beginning of, in architecture at least, developing a studio that was 100% focused towards sustainable design. Amazing. And I did that for 12 years. And at around year 10, I started to wonder, hmm, this is not having the impact that I had hoped. Um, the other studios were great, but they weren't really focusing on sustainability. I didn't see a lot of traction. Um, so I decided that hmm, maybe the model of education that we're using is fundamentally flawed, Probably good for 100 years ago, but not good in the age of climate change. And maybe we need a new model. Maybe we need to think differently. And I thought that education was one of the most core fundamental ways that you can make change in society. It's a long-term view, and it takes a long time for my students to come out and do their thing. So I decided with a couple colleagues, uh, Chris Pestor, Rob Fryer, to build a fundamentally new model from scratch for design education. Wow. Yes. <laughs> um, before you expand on that, yep. could you maybe just define for us some of these terms, such sure. as sustainability or sustainable uh, design? Yes. Well, you I know, I just want to make sure because sometimes yep. you know it, we're thinking about different things when we're when we hear these terms. Absolutely, and I think that's part of the problem is mm -hmm. that there's not a good overall understanding amongst people and design, especially of what sustainability and sustainable design is. I would say that most Fortune 500 companies have it defined as the triple bottom line: mm -hmm. people, profit, planet. I mean, it's actually pretty simple decision making that values all of them equally and takes them into account at least so that you have a more holistic view. What we've done in our view of sustainability was to add place to bring in all the aesthetics and cultural aspects that are so critical, right? So you can make a, a lead rated building that is great for the environment, but nobody wants to be in it. And therefore it'll be torn down pretty quickly and it'll be a waste. So we're really thinking that aesthetics is still a critical part. So that, that is actually a really well understood and well defined definition of sustainability. And sustainable design is just putting those into practice on, on every decision that you make has to consider all four of those variables. So it's a very difficult holistic model of design and it's more challenging to mm. people. And I hate to say it, most architects will lead maybe with aesthetics or maybe something else. And so what you start with is actually really critical to what you end with. Hmm. This is what I've discovered in education. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so people, profit, planet, place. Correct. And in place, you're thinking about aesthetics and how, how mm -hmm. it looks, how it feels, where it is. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you about the second, the yeah. second category, but, profit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so... <laughs> Where and what is the role of capitalism in this system? Yeah. yeah. So this is, I, and you're being very polite. I know you want to dig deeper on that. Um, so profit is sort of the accepted terminology out there in the world. I tend to use the word prosperity okay. as, instead of profit to have a more holistic idea of what it means to be successful. Okay. Um, profit is, of course, a very dangerous word, mm -hmm. um, and there are some people that will use profit to the extent of everything else. So I personally use prosperity, but okay. profit is meant to mean that there is a fundamental human motivation to drive innovation and creativity for profit or for personal gain. And I, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of that completely. Um, we do have a little bit of that in our hard wiring. So how do you channel that in with these other variables so that it becomes working for all four of those variables simultaneously? And the other reason I, I do like profit, and you probably disagree with me, is for whatever reason, profit drives people to move faster, harder, quicker. Okay. Faster, quick, you know mm. what I mean. Okay. Versus collective thinking and empathy is a more powerful model and a more, mm. and ultimately where we want to end up, it moves a lot slower mm. and the impact is a lot slower. Have and you seen me move? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> 
Good point. <laughs> maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm the not the norm. Maybe I'm maybe, the anomaly. Maybe not. Then. No. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe not. I would say that when because you're making collective decisions mm -hmm. in an empathetic model and yeah. a collective model, things tend to move a little slower. Okay. They have more power behind them, and I'm just nervous. So mm -hmm. sometimes I look at for-profit companies and mm -hmm. say, what if they took the quadruple bottom line, still driving their crazy need for profit, but bringing these in yeah. might also help the, equa the overall equation. So I'm not ready to discount profit completely. Okay. It's a very, it's, right now it's destroying us. Yeah. But yes. if we could flip it and turn it into something that could be a tool okay. for the greater good, mm -hmm. which I think is what sustainability and sustainable design is about, that's why I keep it in there. Okay, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Lot to think about yep. on that. I'm sure you want to challenge me more. On I that, do, but but, but 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 <laughs> okay. my ideas aren't aren't necessarily coalesced on it. So I I, okay. I think maybe that'll be mm -hmm. for the second time you come back. <laughs> okay. Sounds <laughs> we'll good. Deeper. Sounds good. Okay, so um, back to kind of this teaching model that you designed. Yeah. Really fascinating yeah, yeah. and so important. And yep. so this is how you engage architects. Yes. So we have five principles. Okay. Tell I actually me. don't really have them, but I'm. I think I do. I'm going to say them right now. But at the core of this gets back to empathy. Great. Because if you look at the history of architectural education specifically, it's based on the critique, and it's based on unfortunately a lot of negativity, where these critiques move into instead of helping the student, they move into sort of this sort of hyperness, that mm. does not inspire students through joy, but inspires them through fear that's, to produce. That's fascinating. I think that that's mm -hmm. academia at large. It is. It was, it that is. was absolutely my experience in graduate yes, school, and absolutely. I think probably a lot of experiences. Right. It was about cr the critique, and, right. and that's what you you got credit for, yeah. was how could you tear this argument apart. Right, and there's, <laughs> a, and there's a certain rush to that, right? So there's two things. We have cortisol, which is our stress drug, yeah. which is released during a critique. And we, we're in our fight-or-flight mode, right. and it's kind of exhilarating, yeah. right? We're in this, like... We're huh. in this duality here, right? And there, so there's some value to that. I don't want to, I, I like to look at things as layers. But ultimately, we want to work with oxytocin, which is our collaboration drug, our empathy drug. So when we come together and we support each other and we encourage each other yeah. and we build a future together that's about making the world better, we can get really good long-term results. Interesting. But it's a fundamental shift. So we had to shift the energy of our program first. Yeah. And once we did that, that opens up lots of other opportunities. You know, when you're talking, Rob, I'm thinking that um, a lot of people today, whatever their specialty is, they're working in a vacuum. And yep. they, they look in like their, their size of the world in terms mm -hmm. of what their specialization, we've become so hyper-specialized that our world is the size of a Petri dish. Right, and um, when I hear you talk, I hear you connecting this world of architecture to so much, including psychology, mm -hmm. really. I'm hearing mm -hmm. so much about, sure. and, and I do that too, I think, because um, there, there are so many different backgrounds and disciplines to what you're speaking about, but you're really driving home the fact that we need to get out of our silos mm -hmm. and our, you know, and this vacuum world that we have and connect to these other broader disciplines and ideas because th they are all truly connected, mm -hmm. right? And so the fact that you are speaking about this, really what I'm hearing from a psychological perspective is key because we have to understand human motivation mm -hmm. and we can't forget what drives humans. Correct. Um, because without that component, the rest is just pure academics, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, something really strange happened when we started the program. When we wrote our website, we didn't really define who could apply. Hmm. So although clearly in our heads it was a built environment program for architects, it quickly morphed into something much bigger and broader. And to the to our betterment. So we started getting applications from environmental scientists, from interior designers, from engineers, from business people, hmm. who all were desperately seeking a place where they could come and discover how they're going to go and work in the world. And Amazing. you know what I did? I said, okay, come on in. Yeah. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens. And it was a total mess at, in the beginning. Didn't know what to do. Okay. Didn't know how to serve all these different people yeah. in the same group. Huh. So, so we, we adopted a principle called everyone engaging everything early. Okay. Every, it's, think of this as the five E's. Everyone okay. mm -hmm. engaging okay. everything okay. early. Okay. And the fifth one, which I've added, that's a Bill Reed, by the way. And the okay. fifth one is with equity. Because Fabulous. what we discovered yeah. is you can build all these collaborative models where everyone's engaging everything early, but not everybody's engaging equally. So we had to bring equity in because we saw that people were being marginalized in, yeah. in the groups, yeah. uh, whether it was because of gender or skin color or various, you know, how we are as humans. We can differentiate pretty quickly. 
And so we've had to, we brought that in and it really created quite a, quite a dynamic environment. The early part is really important. So we'll bring in community members before okay. the students draw okay. and have them draw. Amazing. So we're taking the pencil and we're sharing the pencil and the architects are learning how to facilitate wow. a community stakeholder driven process. Amazing. Rather than just drawing cool forms, which eventually we'll get to, by the way, we're not giving up on cool forms, okay. but we're backloading that and front-loading equity and participation oh into the process. Oh, my gosh, you're speaking to my soul. So they're learning. <laughs> our students are learning how to facilitate that. It, uh, that's amazing, and I think that's been missing. I, I think so. That's incredible. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about what is the um, – what is the? do you know anything about the racial demographics of your students or the class demographics? Or do you keep track of that at all? Uh, not specifically okay. we're measuring with percentages, but okay. traditionally architecture education has been pr predominantly white. I thought so. And for a long time, white male. It's about 50-50 yep. in gender now, but still okay. primarily mostly white people, and certainly in terms of teaching and positions of power. Okay. So one of the things that we did was we gave up on something called a design jury. Design jury in itself has all kinds of negative connotations. Yeah. The student's going to present to a jury and defend their work. Wow. And that jury is a power structure, mm -hmm. usually made up of mostly white guys, usually older, sometimes a female. And typically these power dynamics play out in very unsu unsubtle and subtle ways. And we decided to get rid of that. We okay. thought that that was not a way to inspire students to work and work in communities because a jury is all based, again, on fear. Yep. So the students produce on the fear of being ripped apart by these older white guys, right, yeah. who represent the establishment. Yeah. So we, we got rid of it. Amazing. We just We got rid of it, and we said we, we'll find other ways to interact and have final – we do want some sort of culminating experience, right? The students need to be held accountable. But are there other ways to hold them accountable that are still life enriching and beneficial to the larger community? That's amazing. And what have you found? What? I, how do you do that? I found that it's really hard to do, number okay. one, because you have to be in the moment. Okay. So, for example, we had six guests um, at our last final review or whatever you want to call it. Uh, two women, four men. And I noticed that around mid midway, the four men were in front and the two women were sorting, sitting back further. I'm like, hmm, most of my students are women. So at break, I said, hey, we're going to rearrange the seats a little bit. And I kind of scooched the women up to the front and moved the men back. And I think they understood, the men. Okay. And it, it immediately changed a little bit of the dynamics, Amazing. just slightly. These yeah. subtle things really matter because, as you know, there's yeah. all sorts of implicit bias That's right. playing out in eye contact and body language, et cetera. So we as professors need to model facilitation yeah. benefits that benefits everybody in the process. That's incredible. Um, uh, and, and do you do you know much about um, requirements to get in or the, or the application process? I mean, who can apply to this uh, program? So anyone can apply. Okay. Um, you have to have an undergraduate degree, okay. and you need to like, and, and also this thing about GPA and, and GREs, for example, we okay. got rid of the GRE. Oh, fabulous! Because we didn't see any correlation between high GRE scores and performance in our program. Great. Because we're emphasizing collaboration oh, and group group we work. Need that. Yeah. We were looking at the personal essay and the types of people that we're bringing in who are predisposed to collaborate and lead. Amazing. So we're looking for leadership. Okay. And we do take people from all different backgrounds, if, Amazing. in case you're wondering. You're inspiring me to apply. Uh, absolutely. We have a spot for you. <laughs> okay, fabulous. <laughs> yep. And I think that I, I, I'm so uh, hopeful and um, inspired to hear about how you've been able to uh, to make equity such a significant part of this process mm -hmm. because that has been missing completely. And I love to hear what you say about bringing in stakeholders and community members mm -hmm. to, to talk first and to draw first. I think that's also been missing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I talk mm -hmm. to my students a lot about something called the white savior complex, oh, and yeah. um, and certainly with my organization, which is building housing um, for people experiencing homelessness and their mm -hmm. pets, um, the first thing we do is we go into a community, speak to everybody in that community, and ask them what they want, mm -hmm. um, what their vision is, and and see how we can, um, you know, bring together resources to make their vision happen. Mm -hmm. um, but that it's crucial that you know for nonprofits, but also architects and designers to take into consideration all the stakeholders and um, to maybe put their egos on the back burner, <laughs> which I imagine is hard for architects uh, and designers who have, you know, historically been 
part of the establishment and part, you know, part of the power structure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, originally it was the rich white man's profession, right? right? I mean, that were the only architects. And but I think still largely it is. Yeah. I think yeah. Thomas Jefferson is trying to make a, a difference. And Ab I absolutely. Think, feel really hopeful about that. Absolutely. Are you seeing this catch on? Do you talk to other universities? Do you collaborate with other programs? Um, I'm seeing a general okay. awareness that, and this is the key, self-awareness is really the key. Okay. So for me, social equity didn't really play out directly in my work until I did some of my own work and tried to get in touch with who I am. And, okay. you know, was I a white savior? You know, okay. was I helping students of color so I felt better about myself, right? Mm -hmm. And that comes in long stages and it's constantly a process of yeah. working and being self-aware. And self-awareness, I think, is really lacking right now mm. in design education. Okay. You know, there's still this 100-year-old model of yeah. just being harsh on the students. And we we're re I see a groundswell of people talking about getting out of that. Okay. But I don't see yet the definitive action on the ground. And you know this better than I do. Everyone can say diversity is important, yeah. equity, inclusion, but it's very few people are willing to put the work in yep. and make the fundamental changes that are necessary to actually create an equitable community. I would say we're not there yet. Okay. I could, you could walk into our building and still see lots of examples of people being discriminated against. Um, this is not a pill, mm -hmm. and you can't say one day, okay, we're gonna be fair to everybody. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And I think even in 10 years, we won't be done. And I think there's always gonna be this dynamic happening. So um, that's a big level of work, and it's something I've been spending a lot of time on and writing about and looking forward to doing more work on that. Amazing, I'm reading a book right now called How to Be Anti-Racist. And uh, mm -hmm. it's really valuable and important, but talks a lot about how that this is a process and you're never there, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that doing this work of, of creating equity uh, is ongoing and requires, as you say, a great amount of self-awareness and reflection that never ends. And sometimes that's hard to, to like look at things like that and to, to stop and say, you know, it, what am I doing? How is this, um, you know, uh, creating a more equitable world? Yeah, and, and of course, coming to grips with the fact that sometimes things are going to be uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something I don't like, yeah, personally. Yeah. I'm like an easygoing Me guy, too. but I, there are times when sometimes things need to be said. That's exactly right. Sometimes I have the courage, Yeah. and then it's awkward, yeah, and, and sometimes too. I let it go, Jeez. and I'm like, gosh, I wish I should have, I should have yeah. said something in that moment. Yeah. But Again, it's a process. You you can't. There's not. There's so many battles to fight and yeah. sort of picking picking them. Absolutely. But ultimately, being student centered, and I think sometimes yeah. in universities we forget that the students are the center of everything that That's we do, right. and making sure their experience is going to be the best for them. That's and if right. you're a different gender or a different skin color that's that that could be a challenge yeah. sometimes depending on who you're interacting with so to try to make those pathways that's equal right. for everyone is a real challenge amazing but it seems like um you're really modeling so so many important things for your students including um how to be reflective how to be sit in discomfort which yeah. i think we're not taught to do no. and it's not maybe in our nature and it's a it's a learned skill that is vital and right. you're i think that you're modeling that and it's key um because a lot of this is just uncomfortable uh, and, and can create conflict and we are pro many of us uh, me and you definitely are mm -hmm. prone to be anti-conflict and sometimes that right. doesn't further you know our mission of creating more equitable and just Correct. world um, so thank you for the incredible work that you do, Rob. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful listening to you for, you know, and knowing that there are all these students in your classroom um, who are going to be learning from you. Um, so we're going to take another short break and we'll be back very shortly to talk more about Rob, to, to Rob Fleming um, and certainly more about his, his, his book and uh, what we can collectively do to make a difference. So we'll be right back. Our hearts are made stronger by how we treat others. Put her there. The light you share can impact those around you, but so can the darkness. Later, twerps. Did Pete saying mean things bother you? So when you reach out to another person, <laughs> take a moment to consider how they will feel and let your heart be the key to making a difference. Because of you, someone's entire day, year, or even life can change. In every heart, there's hope. Hello, my name is Melvin Prince Johnny, and I'm running for the 3rd Congressional District, 
city of Philadelphia and the great state of Pennsylvania. We're 16 days in in January. There's more than 22 killings in our city. You need a community congressman that will go block by block, door by door, and fix this problem. Now, I think it's economics, but you might think it's something else. And I'm coming so you can tell me what it is. Once again, my name is Melvin Prince Jonik, and I'm running for the third congressional district. Thank you. Thank you and welcome back to Thinking Constellationally. I'm your host, Stephanie Senna, and we're on USALA Media. We're talking today with Rob Fleming, the Director and Professor of Sustainable Design at Thomas Jefferson University. And we've been having such an amazing conversation. Rob, you're brilliant and I'm grateful to have you Thank with you. us today. Um, and so I think for this last segment, I'd like to talk about kind of next steps, where do we go from here? We know that our, our planet is on fire. We see evidence of this every single day. Um, so really, what can we do um, individually and collectively uh, now to start making a huge difference? Um, before I, 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 I turn it to you to give ideas, though, I want to just tell a quick story about what I've been doing. Um, I decided recently that I was going to start composting, um, and uh, I I have been thinking a lot more about my own output. I also, about two years ago, decided to become a vegetarian um, and shift to an all plant based diet, um, which is um, I'm, I I feel good about for the last two years, um, and then recently decided I was going to start composting. So, I. Um, I didn't know what that meant, though. Uh, I live in the city. I don't have a backyard, a yard, or any, mm. you know, gr ground. But I, I had seen these like um, buckets that people put their their mm -hmm. food waste into. So, so one of the first things I did was I went and got a bucket. But uh, I didn't really. Again, I hadn't done a ton of research, which is unusual. I usually research the heck out of everything. But I was so overwhelmed with so many things, and I was just like, well, I'll just get a bucket. I'll start there, and then I'll figure it out. So it was like a, a bucket that would hold about uh, maybe a pound of food waste. Mm -hmm. And so uh, every day that week, I was pretty overwhelmed, but I would put my, f or, uh, the, my family's food waste into the bucket. But I still didn't know about, okay, what to do after the bucket is filled. <laughs> so this right. is very, I, I just was like, okay, I'm composting now. <laughs> so I put the food in a food bucket and then the week ended and I still did not have a plan, but I had food in a food bucket. So then I thought, okay, and I guess this was also, even though I, I researched the heck out of everything, I'm very, very busy. And sometimes when I can't figure something out, I procrastinate a little too long. So this was me procrastinating on kind of having a game plan for what to do here. So then um, I, uh, then my next thought once the bucket was filled is, okay, I don't know what to do with this now food waste. Um, but I am, go and I recognize how stupid this sounds, uh, but but I but I gladly share with the world my stupidity. Um and so then I decided that I was going to put the food waste in a brown bag and put it in the freezer because I felt like wow. once it freezes, then I'll know what to do with okay. it. <laughs> I recognize how ridiculous this is. So then, um, so it was late one night uh, and I took all the food out of the bin, put it in a brown bag paper bag, put it in the freezer to let it freeze. It was probably about 9.30 at night. Everyone's going to sleep. I close up the kitchen. My son is in the living room, like finishing watching the office for the 12 million time. Um, and I, I looked at Jonah. It was right after Halloween. And I said to Jonah, uh, kitchen's closed. Bedtime in a couple minutes. Don't go back into the refrigerator. Don't go into the freezer. And I told him that I didn't want him to open the freezer because there was all that food that it was waiting to freeze. But also that's where all the candy was. And I, yeah. what I meant is you're done eating candy. You're done. Right. Right. Um, and so uh, I said that to him. No more candy for tonight. But he being... Jonah did not listen to me. And I went upstairs to, to like start getting ready for bed. And I, I suddenly heard uh, uh, something loud crash and, and a scream. Mm. And I ran downstairs. And what I found when I got to the kitchen is Jonah standing there with a big brown bag on the floor and a week's worth of food waste all at his feet. Uh, and so what happened is he went in for that 
25th bar of Snickers <laughs> open up the freezer despite me saying don't do that and he uh, when he when he did that he opened up the freezer and the food all fell out and mm. it created a huge uh, mess everywhere and so um, I was angry he was upset and he just said I don't want to compost and he said I know that you are an amazing person. This is what he said to me. Wow. He's 13 years old. I know you're an amazing person and you want to save the world, but I am just trying to live my life. <laughs> yeah. He's like, sure. I don't want to do good. this. Why are you forcing this right, on me? Right, right. I, then, so I then finally did the research and I, I connected to a compost company and now I get a, a bin that they give me, fill it up with food waste every week, put it out at, at, at my door. It's called Bennett Compost in the city. There's nice. a few different ones and mm -hmm. they come and they compost it, turn it into mulch and they can bring it back to people who can use it in their garden. I don't nice. have a garden because I don't have outside space. Right, right. But uh, that's just my little story in terms of sometimes we're just doing the best we can and we don't have the knowledge to yep. figure out. And so that was kind of my little story about <laughs> how I'm trying, but sometimes I don't have the knowledge at my fingertips. Right, right. And that's that's a great story. And you you exemplified one strategy, which is jump in. Yes. <laughs> just dive, I don't know how to swim, but I'm going to dive in yeah. this 12 foot deep water. The risk was pretty low. Right. And then there are other people who will research for months on yeah. the internet and then they'll slowly take action. Yeah. I don't care which way you go. Yeah. I wish more people would jump in and make mistakes yeah. and learn from those mistakes. That's a pretty quick way, sometimes painful. Yeah. Uh, I've made my fair share of mistakes trying to change my behaviors. And I agree with your son. Sometimes I'm like, I don't want to deal with this sustainability <laughs> stuff. I don't, you know, those people are far away or that's way yeah, off in the field. Yeah. I'm just trying to live my life here, yeah. right? And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that because we're hardwired for that. That's why I talked about that earlier. Is just, people shouldn't feel guilty. guilty. This is where I think also, I don't like the idea that sustainability would do, be done out of guilt. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be done out of hope or out of strategy or of some larger sort of strategy of life. Um, so, so there's the personal level, which you talked about, which I think everybody has to engage in, and, and generally a lot of people are. Um, there is another level of engagement, which you're doing, and a lot of other people are doing, which is stepping up and taking some sort of leadership role. That leadership role could be in their community, it could be in their organization, it could be in their family, but some sort of saying, and I suppose you did this in a way by you're imparting composting to your kids indirectly or directly, that um, if you're working in a company, now is the time to step up and say, hey, company, are we being sustainable? Do we have a zero carbon footprint? We have to put pressure on the organizations that are maximizing profit right now to also begin to maximize the planet's availability of resources and, and also people. And I think without that kind of leadership, in, internal leadership and external leadership, we're not going to have the pressure on the profit-making system that you're so worried about, that I'm worried about too, to really make the intrinsic changes. So if you look at the Fortune 500 companies right now, most of those are heading towards zero carbon. And now some of that's not legit through bogus offsets, carbon offsets that they're purchasing, even though they're still spending money. And some of them are legit. There are some companies that want to be, we're going to be carbon neutral because we're going to put solar panels. We're going to build thousands and thousands of solar panels. And we're going to do it legitimately. And it's really happening. This is the thing, because I'm in this. So that's why I'm still so optimistic, because I do see in private industry some movement. Um, regardless of what's happening in the government. They're like, yeah, we're not waiting for the government anymore. This is something we believe in. And there's enough people internally fighting for this and showing leadership that it's starting to happen intrinsically. And then we have hope. I know that was a long statement there, but um, I, I just think that people, you know, if you're watching this or listening to this, think about what, you, what your next level of engagement is going to be. Are you going to go into your neighborhood and talk about starting a compost bin that people could share? Are you going to go talk to your local congressperson about making the recycling program better? You know our recycling program is a wreck in this yes. country. China won't take our waste anymore. We're not good at recycling as a country. We're throwing all kinds of stuff in the recycling bins. Right. We have the lowest quality recycled content. That's right. um, and so, you know, maybe you become the neighborhood leader on how to recycle properly. Yeah. So, so I think mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, so we did, we did have China had been taking our recycling yep. for a very long time, and Correct. then they stopped yep. about two years ago, maybe. Correct. Um, yep. And so now, when we used to pay China to take our recycling, um, yep. we're tr we're every every city is kind of trying their, this ad hoc thing. It's becoming very expensive, and what yeah. we're doing, I think we had been doing a lot more is. is 
incinerating our, our recycling. In Chester. In Chester, yeah. which also the incineration plant is near people of color and people yeah. who are already mm -hmm. under resourced to begin with in the poorest neighborhood. Correct. Right. So so that and when you incinerate your trash, that is the worst thing to do with trash because it releases like massive toxins into the environment. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so 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 tell tell me what to do for well, that. Let yeah. me give you some example. Okay. That was a case study. So one of our students who I wouldn't say she was angry, but she came to our program because she wanted to do something meaningful. Okay. And she was an architect, didn't want to be an architect anymore. And she she looked at waste and trash. And she decided for her thesis to start a new nonprofit called Rare, Recycled Artists in Residence, which is basically taking construction waste, which is a huge problem, right? And using that to help artists make large scale installations. Amazing. And she ended up not only starting that in her thesis and receiving her first grant in her thesis for 40000 to start wow. that from the city. She also joined a company called Revolution Recovery, which is the construction waste management company, where she's now a manager, coordinator, director of sustainability for that company. So she's managed to make a living in sustainability, but also facilitate other kinds of changes through, through the use of art. And there are hundreds and hundreds of people like Fern Gukin that are doing things, changing their lives fundamentally and shifting their lives to value, to change, to match their priorities and their values, right? Wow. It takes a lot of courage to do that, right? Because most people are very comfortable in their jobs. Um, but sometimes we have, we're called to step yeah. up and look for something different, right? That's incredible. Like when I redesigned, when we started a whole new graduate program, I didn't yeah. have to do that, but you know, it's what's needed. And I think there's a difference between what we want and what we need. We all are intrinsically driven to get what we want, but we also have to work on what society needs and what we need. And that takes a lot more energy, as you know. Yeah. yeah. And so finding that courage and that energy is really critical to do that. I think, too, though, um, when we talk about climate crisis, this problem is so incredibly massive and all-pervasive. And while we talked in the beginning about, you know, sometimes the the um, instinct is to throw your hands up in the air and say, I'm out, uh, if you reframe it, and that's what we've been really doing all this whole hour is reframing mm -hmm. some of these narratives that are not uh, moving us forward. If we reframe this uh, issue that is so intense and say the flip side, the positive, the good side about this issue of climate crisis being so massive and pervasive and huge is that we are all called on to make a difference based on our own interests, right? So, mm -hmm. so y y we all have an entryway into this Correct. and we can lean on the talents, the passions that we already have have mm -hmm. um, because each one of us can make a difference. So in terms of Fern with Rare, yep. my guess is that Fern already had probably some interest or talent in art, right? Cor correct. It sounds design. like yep. design. Yep. And sure. Yeah, so, so then to marry that together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if your interest is in design or if it's in, you know, statistics or math or research or, you know, th like there is a place if you uh, for anybody to plug in really. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, you're creating those pathways yes. of entry. We are. Yeah. That's, that's we're that's doing that key. consciously. Yep. Incredible. Yep. You're mm -hmm. giving me so much hope, Rob. <laughs> Good. Don't go away. Good. Uh, no, not <laughs> <Ever>. at all. <laughs> um, okay, so amazing. Other things that we can do. Um, yeah, so, I mean, for me, I'm writing books. Yeah. And um, I'm writing books because at a university, you can have a certain amount of impact. Okay. But what if there was a textbook yeah. that had all of the stuff that we talked about today, including equity, all of that in a textbook that other universities could adopt and run the course. Amazing. So I have a writing partner named Seglinda Roberts. She's great. She's one of our alums as well. She teaches at Chatham University now. Okay. So she's teaching the course based on this book, my course, of course, and that I'm teaching. And then also Kane University and now Drexel has yeah. decided to adopt this textbook. Fabulous. So textbooks are a challenge um, because they're not as exciting as like a reader book. But what we're finding is that there is a missing gap of a really good sustainable design textbook in the world. Okay. Okay. And we're hoping that this book will fill that gap. Okay. Um, would I love to get a second edition out immediately? Absolutely. But okay. as you know, we have to be okay with some, some things that are flawed. Sure. And so the book is out there. It's selling really well. And we're going to hopefully get more universities to adopt this book and make it part of their curriculum. Okay. If other people want to adopt the book, how can they do so? Yeah. So the name of the book is Sustainable Design for the Built Environment. And it's uh, Rob Fleming, Segunda Roberts, uh, Taylor Francis. You can get it on Amazon. But you would want to email me and contact me because we have teacher references and other guides and PowerPoints that we built for Amazing. everybody. So if you want to adopt this course, we're going to give you everything you need 
to do this, Incredible. including assignments, exercises, PowerPoints, videos. We're just trying That's to make amazing. it as easy as possible for another professor or another university to adopt the course. We're amazing. really excited about that. Okay, mm -hmm. and how can people uh, reach out and connect to you then? At this point, email is still the best way. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm a certain age group. So sure. robert.fleming at jefferson.edu. And I'm happy to respond to any emails. And if it leads to somebody else, then I'm happy. I'm a connector, as you probably could guess. Okay. So if you email me and you say, I want to do X, I will try to connect you to the person or company that could best help you or a nonprofit that could best help you. Amazing. Um, so so there's many ways to get connected to you and and your feeling of like, okay, you, Rob Fleming, want to push the needle forward, you know, forward in, t in terms of this. And one of the ways of many, because I see you tackling this in a multi-pronged attack, but one of the prongs is education. Yeah. And it's not just limited to the students who, who are lucky enough to, ha to have their butts in the chairs in your classroom. Right. But also, you know, you are spreading this knowledge through the use of the textbook and the curriculum to other universities so that other professors throughout the country and the world might be able to have access to That's this. That's the plan. Amazing. And then also you give conferences too, right? You yeah. present at conferences. Yeah, well, we presented together. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. We had a lot of energy there. And you there. were incredibly engaging. Oh, well, That's thank you. Key. Thank you. I'll yeah. be in uh, San Diego in a couple months presenting about our master's program and about an alternative form of education to the mainstream audience of architecture. Okay. So I'm constantly getting out there and trying to move the needle, as you would say, and usually two or three people will walk up afterwards and say, hey, you know, we're ready to go. And I want to mention, I wrote the book at a straightforward high school level, so I'm hoping that high schools, any high school would be able to adopt this curriculum. Great. So it's not, so I think, important. yeah. So because not everybody it. has the ability and the resources to find I, themselves course, in, a, right? in a, you know, undergrad or graduate program. Exactly. So I think that we need exactly. to start young, yes. and high school is, is important. I wish that I had had that. I wish I'd had you as a teacher when I was when I was younger. Um, and just to that point, just because I'm plugging now, yeah. uh, there's a site. So I put my course up for free to the world. So this course that we're talking about, anybody can take for free. They can go to buildacademy.com, and that's one word, and they can find my course. Take it for free, and um, you'll get all the knowledge. Amazing. Um, have you read the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Kimmerer? I have not. Okay. I guess I should, right? Please. It's okay. beautiful. It's beautiful, and um, she is... Um, it's, it's about the teaching of plants and indigenous culture. Okay. And I okay. think that in reading it, I was incredibly inspired uh, about how different cultures see this and how they are building for sustainable design. Right. You'll find a lot of that in that, how we need to work collectively to combat climate crisis. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of hope in that. And nice. I think that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it, your speaking reminds me a lot of her writing. Oh, cool. Um, okay. But I think that you would find a lot of hope and inspiration and, and maybe other listeners too. So I, I'll just put that out there as uh, maybe something on your on your read list. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm uh, I'm gonna go get your textbook, okay. uh, and uh, I, because I think that there's something in it for everybody, and we all desperately need these lessons. Um, Rob, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and teaching us uh, all about what we can do uh, f to fight climate crisis, and most importantly, how how we can um, use hope as a strategy for making a difference, which we desperately need today. Um, Rob, you inspire me, and um, I learned a lot. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Okay, so uh, that's it for our show today on Thinking Constellationally on USA LA Media. We'll be back next week with another special guest. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I'm your host, Stephanie Senna, and have a good week. Take care.